Hello, everybody, and welcome to Epic Realms. I'm your host, Nick, and with us today, we have an amazing guest. He founded Darkness Radio over 16 years ago and can be seen on Discovery Plus's Paranormal Night Shift. I'd like to welcome paranormal expert, and he's going to hate me for saying that, oh. Tim Dennis. Welcome to the show. Oh, Nick. <laughs> the two words. You could have used paranormal contributor. No. Nope. Here's, here's my thought. Here's my thought on this. And I, 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 I said that intentionally because uh, you've been doing darkness radio for over 16 years. You've been interviewing uh, the best in cryptids, ghosts, paranormal, everything. So yeah. 16 years with the best in each individual field. And you know, all of those people, I mean, a PhD is eight years. You've got 16 with the best people from every genre. If you don't get closer to an expert than that, I don't know how you do it. I know guys who play professional football and hockey too. That doesn't make me a professional football player or a hockey player either. I know professional wrestlers, but I'm not a professional wrestler. <laughs> Damn you <laughs> for coming oh, up with yeah. that in, in intelligent logic. But you do know a ton. Like you know a ton and you've been conversing with them. So it's like you're studying. And you've had, I mean, how do you hold, how do you hold a conversation with somebody about something unless you know what you're talking about, right? At least to a little extent. Because you, because you read, Nick, that's why, that's why you know it. I mean, I, a parrot can, can speak English, tell you to, to you and tell you to F off if you tell him to F off enough. <laughs> I mean, you, you can mirror each other and, and, I'm, and I'm trying to hype you up here. Come on now. <laughs> oh, I, know, I know, I know what you're saying, but I mean, <sighs> just take the compliment. Just take uh, okay. The compliment. I'll take, I'll take the compliment, but I, I didn't call myself an expert. Uh, the, the, I, the, I mean, we, in the, in the logic here and, and, and I'll just, I'll, I'll say thank you first before I rebuff your, your, uh, <laughs> expert. Um, the reason why I don't like paranormal expert is because along the way we all learn, we all mm -hmm. still learn. And none of us can say we've ever been there and stayed there and had a, a lengthy stay and came back and can tell everybody exactly what happens on that other side and, and how everything works. Um, I, I don't think any one of us has an, an idea, you know, I'll put it to you this way. Mm -hmm. Recently talking to Mark Anthony yes, about, um, about the electromagnetic soul, a new yet not so new spin on how a soul works, um, gives me an idea. If you relate it to quantum physics, to me, it makes the most sense out of what an afterlife could mm -hmm. possibly be mixing the scientific with the metaphysical. Okay. Um, even a skeptic can look at it and go, okay, yeah, I, I can buy your theory, you know, that, that it has to be tied to our physical world. You know, if, if we're energy, then heaven has to have some sort of energetic or quantum physical component, you would think. Right. That energy has to go somewhere to exist. And if there is some sort of, if you believe in, in reincarnation, mm -hmm. there has to be some recycling ground for that energy to come back right. and that soul to reenter a physical body. So, you know, it, it just has to has that, it has to have a, a, a place to go for that energy to loop. Right. Okay. Well, because don't they say that energy doesn't disappear. It doesn't just stop existing. Right, right. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, yeah, it doesn't die or it doesn't, it doesn't create, it just transforms. Mm -hmm. So if you believe that, then there has to be some place for that energy to cycle to come back and go back into another body for that energy to continue to transform or that energy has to go somewhere to be used. Right. And to be recycled somewhere. So to me, Mark Anthony's theory, we'll call it that. Sure, theory, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, until it's proven, it's a theory. Works the best for me, I think. I mean, yeah. that's 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 just what I think. Is that one of those things where you, where something that where, that a guest said or has come back on has done, 
is that something that has changed your outlook on things since you started? It's one of them. I, there, there have been over the years, I'll tell you when we, honestly, Nick, when we first started, um, I went from, I went from being a kid who had visits, um, from relatives, whether it be out of body or in dreams to having a complete crisis of faith to being woken up at night, thinking there was nothing there. I mean, nothing there thinking I was going to be warm food, nothing, you know, almost an, not an atheistic take on things, but having real fear and real anxiety and wondering where, where I had lost that way. And then doing the show, getting different stories from different people and hearing their experiences. And then from there thinking to myself, okay, well, if they've had these experiences, and not looking at people, and you know, <laughs> there's a, there's a common, I think there's a common misconception that maybe in the past, Dave and I had looked at everybody's stories kind of with like a hem and a haw and a ha 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 and kind right. of rolled our eyes. Right. I don't think that that's necessarily the case with every story. Um, you have to remember that not everybody's story is worthy of a giggle or a guffaw or... Right. You know, everybody looks at everybody's story differently. So what you may think is kind of a bat bleep crazy story to one person may be touching somebody's heart in, in a different aspect to somebody else. And there were some stories that I heard that I thought, no, there's just no way this rings true with right. me. And there's other stories that I went, you know what, this, this kind of makes mm -hmm. a little sense or it, it plucks, it plucks a heartstring here. I, I get it. Um, but through the years, not only just stories that I heard, but people that I've met that have actually had these experiences. Right. And then on investigations, things that I've seen and heard told me, well, you know what? You can't possibly have that opinion that there's nothing after this. Right. You've seen too much. You've heard too much. You've gone through too much. To think that there's nothing at the end, but even with all that said, Nick, I still had one of those anxiety moments the other night, and I was trying to figure out where it was coming from. It's weird. Yeah, it's just weird. Yeah. Are there guests that have like? I understand that there are guests that come onto the show, and you're like, "Come on now, really?" And I think there there have even been times where it's like we can't you know, belligerent guests even. Are there guests that literally came on and you're like, I can't talk because I'm either choked up or crying or like their story has affected you in such an emotional, impactful way that you had a hard time continuing the show? Never, never continuing the show. Uh, I've had moments where I've been a little choked up. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But never not continued. Um, you have to, there comes a time and I learned this very young, um, young in my broadcasting career, you have to separate yourself, even though you become emotionally invested in the story, you have to separate yourself from your subject. Right. Um, because you're not working for yourself. You're working for your audience. You're working for your listener. And your job is to not be the center of attention of the interview or the fleshing of the story, your job is to guide the story. Right. And for me to break down in an interview shows you that I've become the center of attention. Yeah. And that's not the point. The point is for me to frame each guest in a way that you get the best story out of what it is I'm presenting. Okay. So, so if I, if I bring a guest to a show, uh, whether it be true crime Tuesday, whether it be darkness radio, the reason I'm bringing that person on is because I believe they have an interesting story to tell you. It's not up to me to tell you whether I think it's a great story 
or it's a, pardon my language, a bullshit story. Right. It's not up to me. Okay. It's up to you. Now, the next day I may get comments on social media, on Facebook, whatever. And I'm not crying, by the way, I have a leaky sinus. I, <laughs> I had the shot to the eye oh, no. last week. So I, I, my sinuses are running quite a bit. Um, it's not up to me to, to, to cast any judgment on any of these. Right. Um, I had a guest recently. I won't say who it is. I brought him on. And I, I, even though the numbers were pretty good for the show, the first wave of reaction was kind of, eh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that I believe this guy. Right. Because it went against what everybody knows. Right. And the first reaction, and I'll tell you this, Nick, the first reaction is always to any subject that's outside the box. Right. To any subject that, and I'm choosing my words carefully here, to any subject that challenges your belief is always, oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. No. Mm -mm. It's because we get it ingrained in our head. This is the way I was raised. Mm -hmm. This is how I know things. This is how I go about my life. If you're going to try and challenge what I know, even though we say we're open-minded, right? Even though we say we're going through this paranormal thing and we're looking for answers, we're not looking for answers. We're looking for pacifiers. Right. We're looking for things to tell us that, you know what, we're, we're looking for the validation. The, Validation from one, but we're looking for the, 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 the end of the story. We're looking for the way the story ends at the end of the book. And we want it to be a happy ending. And God damn it, you better tell me that the story at the end of the book is a good ending. Right. Okay. So I'm going to peek ahead to the end of the storybook and you tell me it's a good ending. Okay. So you have on a guest that tells me that that ending is rosy. And it's good, and it's just the way I believe it. That's what I want you to have on your show. Now, when somebody tells you, no, that's not the way the book's written. The book's written like this. This is what the book really means. It's going to be a good ending, but it's not the ending you really ex expect. Right. But this is the way I see it, and it doesn't really fit A, B, and C. It's more like Z, Y, X, P, Q, Z. And you're like, oh, no, 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 uh, that's not how it goes. Then you get challenged. And you and some people can't fit that mold. And automatically, that person's crazy. Right. Um, the one thing I do wish, I guess, a little bit with, with not just our listeners, but listeners in general, is that before they go, ah, I've heard 10 minutes of this, I, I can't, no, I can't is they go, wait a minute, okay, I'm going to put away my, my judgment hat. I'm going to take it off. I'm going to put it over here. And I'm going to listen a little bit more and see if I can relate to three things and what this person said. Right. If I can't, if I can't relate to three things, I'm going to shut it off. I'll come back tomorrow. I've been listening for, you and I talked off stream. I've been listening for yep. quite a while. Uh, mm -hmm. Just, I'm an old Art Bell fan back in the day. And obviously you guys filled that niche when I didn't have access to Art Bell. And I was just like, darkness radio is awesome. And there would always be guests that didn't fit my paradigm, but I would always listen. Cause there would always be one nugget that I pulled out that I go, you know, that makes sense to me. That one little nugget makes sense. And it makes sense because this other guest that doesn't even know who this guest is from three weeks ago said something. Mm -hmm. that fits that one little part. And that makes sense to me. And yeah. that could be the key. And I'm sure for you, after listening to 16 years worth of guests, it's got to give you a little bit more insight or at least make you feel like you have a little bit more insight as to, you know, some of those end of the book things. Well, to expound on what you're saying, Nick, I was a huge fan of Art Bell. I would sit up, there were nights where I would start to listen to, to, uh, to art. And I would listen to the first hour and I go, God damn it. He's got me for hour two. <laughs> and 
And then we would continue on. Why? Because Art would spin a, he'd spin a yarn and he was good at it. And he had a way of bringing you in and he'd bring the subject in. And he had a way of going not only just from hour to hour, but segment to segment. Because, you know, he had to take those, he had to take those breaks and he had, he had to pay the bills, right? Yes. So he had a way of going from segment to segment and putting it all together. And when he did that, um, as, as many of his producers will tell you as well, he had a way of putting the story together in short little bits that there's a way of accentuating a guest's strengths and minimizing their weaknesses. But there's also a way of steering the story when it's time to unleash the beast, so to speak. Okay. Right. Um, and if Art didn't like a guest so much and felt like the guest was getting out of control, he'd let the guest get out of control and mm-hmm. then dismiss them. Yeah. <laughs> and he did it very forcefully. And he was very good at it. Right. Um, and that led to the comedy element of it. He was not always serious. Right. Uh, I think people over the years have this idea that Art was this paranormal god who dealt with the subject very seriously but people seem to forget the if you think you're satan line call now <laughs> you know they, i they forgot forget. about that actually yeah a lot of people do a lot of people <laughs> the, the the comedy and the jokiness that was art bell you know if you've been abducted by an alien line call now he had a lot of comedic elements to his to his overnight stint, but he was doing it five nights a week. Right. You know, there was a lot of time to fill. Um, But he would also turn loose on a guest when he thought that guest was not legit. When he thought that guest guest was trying to crank your screws a little to the left too much. Right. Um, When he realized he was, they were trying to take him for a ride a little too much. Mm -hmm. That's when he turned loose on a guest. And I also like the fact that a lot of times he would do that and, like they, they, they might not know. And they're like, Oh, he just accepts whatever you can call and say whatever. And they won't see it coming. Cause he, you know, oftentimes will start off giving people the benefit of the doubt. And then when he's like, no, nope, I'm done. <laughs> yep. But see, he, he did that on call-ins. Okay. There were carefully researched and carefully vetted guests that he had on that were serious. And those were the guests that, drew us in the ones he had on for hours the right. ones that we have on that we feature on our show um there have been a few that we thought we had carefully researched and carefully vetted and we got them on and they went a little left and and art had a few of those too right. and in that time you do have to kind of turn the screw to the left and thank you for coming have a nice day and you you let them go um but for the most part they're vetted Right, and right. and you and you continue on. Um, I don't think, and I know you know Nick, but I don't think people realize how hard of a process that is. Um, you know, people say, "Oh, I'm just going to start a paranormal podcast and we're going to grab guests and this thing's going to be easy." It's not. No, it's far from it. Well, just scheduling alone and prepping and and learning. You know, if you have someone on that you don't know, like obviously. I, I know who you are. I've listened to the show. So for me, this show is going to, I was like, this is going to be one of the easiest, most fun shows I have because I feel like I already know you. And as we talked back, like before we started, like we have a lot of stuff in common. So mm-hmm. even though you don't know me, I also think you're going to get along with me just fine. So, with oh, that, yeah, absolutely. so yeah. you know, but if you have somebody on that, you, you know, you literally, you don't know them, but you know, this is their stuff and you have to research them. That's not easy. And no. then you have to interview them and you don't know if you're going to have chemistry with them and you don't know if they're going to give you one word answers. Well, here's, and here's the thing about being a halfway decent interviewer and, and <laughs> I haven't flexed my interviewing muscles in quite a while, mm-hmm. uh, to be honest with you. So I, I'm, I'm still getting the, the rust, the, my ring rust out right. <laughs> that way. My, my, my ring rust when it comes to uh, interviewing. Um, 
wrestling jargon for those who don't know we'll wrestling get, jargon, we'll get yeah. to it later <laughs> well I'm, I'm trying to turn the show into a wrestling show i don't know if you know that or not nick that's at least what my detractors say. right right um it's not but, wrestling it's underwater needle pointing <laughs> that's right it's, it's it's an underwater needle point show and if you guys um, want these inside jokes you're gonna have to listen to darkness radio to understand <laughs> that's right exactly uh but uh what what makes a good interviewer isn't necessarily coming up with chemistry. It's developing it because you don't in real life, you don't have chemistry with everybody. You, you're going to meet people that rub you the wrong way. Right. Uh, you're going to meet people that creep you out. You're going to meet people that you just don't have a vibe with, but it's finding the common denominator and always finding the common denominator is in the material that they present. Um. So if, if I come on your show and, you know, I've created the world's best widget, you know, right. well, obviously the world's best widget is what we're talking about. And if I know a little bit about what you're building in your world's best widget, well, then we have something to talk about. Yeah. It's the, the fringe stuff around the world's best widget is where you develop that, that, uh, that little, uh, bit of a connection between the two of you. Right. So, yeah. How have you dealt with in the past when you have a guest on and it's, like pulling teeth to try and get them to answer. Cause you, you kind of got your thing of what you want to do. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I did that. It's like, can, can you expand about that? Yeah, yeah I, I can. <laughs> <laughs> how do you, how do you deal with that? What is, what is your tips and tricks on, on dealing with that? There's a, there's a way to work somebody out of that rhythm when they're answering in short, short sentences. Mm -hmm you don't leave open-ended questions or, or, you know, closed, closed questions. You avoid yes, no questions. Right. Um, you have to open up the question to interpretation. Um, so if I were asking you a question, I would say, well, Nick, do you like ice cream? That's a yes or no question. Right. So it would be, well, Nick, what's your favorite flavor of Rocky Road? Or what's your favorite flavor of, uh, of, of ice cream? And you would tell me what? We'll say chocolate. Chocolate. What do you like about chocolate? It's delicious. <laughs> and, and no, not everybody likes it. Well, what do you find so delicious about chocolate? Is it the texture? Is it the flavor? What is it about chocolate that, that kind of gets you into chocolate? As long as it doesn't have chocolate chunks in it, I'm good to go. Well, what is it about the chocolate <laughs> chunks that kind of turn you off? See, because you, it's a, yeah, right. Exactly. You, you delve into, into the, the, the minutia of chocolate for a little bit and get them into that. Is it a bad childhood experience? Tell me about the bad childhood experience you had with chocolate. Right. Um, you know, at that point, you're kind of going back and forth of, of, you know, you get into the minutia of what it is and maybe you can jump onto a different uh, subject of, of what it was about that. And then you can jump onto something else and try to build a little bit of a rapport and then get into something else into yeah. it jump onto a different topic that can jump off of something you developed in that, in that moment. Um, a lot of times if you're sticking to the material and something offshoots off that material, a lot of times if you're listening, the best interview is something you're listening to. Right. And then you find something off something you're listening to. The best interviewers are the best listeners. That's that is. And that's something that I've had to learn, not learn, but relearn, like you said, Mm -hmm. um, we talked on the side. I used to do it. I stopped for a while and then I was doing it and I was like, this isn't how I wanted it to go. What am I doing wrong and mm -hmm. getting in back into it. And, uh, with that, you obviously, you were doing editing and producing before, and now you're doing, I mean, you were still a host, but you're doing a lot more of the one-on-one -on -one interviews now. How hard was it to shift from one to the other? I like, used the show. Yeah, I hadn't used that muscle in a long time. Um, you know, people really do forget. And and I shouldn't say forget. The people in the podcast community didn't know me as anything but a, a guy in the corner who read news every once in a while. Right. Um and made a made a smart ass remark. Right. <laughs> That's all he knew me as. Um there's nothing realize, wrong with that. The smart asses no, are what keep everybody no. entertained. <laughs> but they hadn't realized that for you know 16, 17 years before that. I, I had done morning shows. I had called ball games. I had done farm reporting. I'd done, you know, I'd done all this. I, I'd done newscasts. I had done, uh, I mean, you name it, I'd done it. I'd worked, I'd worked music radio. Um, yeah. 
you know, I, I'd had all this, this experience in the background and this was the, you know, to me that this wasn't, it wasn't downgrading. What it was, was I took this and believe it or not, I'd ran radio stations. Right. When, when darkness radio started, it was, it was the last thing on my plate. The very last thing on my plate. I, I was operations manager at two different radio stations. And I had a third radio station that I was overseeing. And that's when Dave approached me about doing a show. So I was like, yeah, sure. Okay. What do you want to do? Uh, I got a couple of radio stations over here. I need to get, and I was in the middle of moving a radio station. Right. So I don't know if you've ever tried to move a radio station by yourself because it <laughs> no. it's a lot of work. I worked it, at a radio station for about a year. That's it. <laughs> when it's you and a sales manager in an outfit out of North Carolina telling you that it's all on you to move the radio station, that's that's a lot. It was completely automated. Um, so, you know, t- trying to line all that up and, and get, you know, get electronics and office furniture moved and a satellite dish off your roof. That's uh, the size of a, a small uh, semi, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. Right. Um, but then on top of it, you know, having your buddy go, well, by the way, I want to start a show, you know, you, you just go, you want to what, you right. know, and then he wanted to start it next week and you go, nah, I ain't going to happen, <laughs> you know? Well, when you started the show, I mean, you already had paranormal experiences in your life. So I'm, mm-hmm. would you tell us about that? How, how that kind of tied into the darkness radio? Uh, you know, at the time I'd had them and I was interested in the paranormal, um, very interested in the paranormal, but it was one of those things that I had, um, I guess for lack of a better term, I had buried a little bit, but I was interested in them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had more in store. I, I, I had, I had had, I had even had one a couple of years before we started the show. Um, I had a couple actually, uh, my, the, the, the most recent one before the show started was my uncle David was, was, uh, terminally ill with, uh, leukemia. And, uh, he, uh, we'd, we'd gone out to my cousin's wedding and, um, we knew he wasn't doing well. We were, we were just hoping that he was going to last uh, for the wedding. So, I, it, you know, you could, you could say, well, you were front loaded at, at this point, but we didn't know really, you know, how m- much longer he had. He was, he was lucid. He was fine. He was walking around. There was, it wasn't like he was, you know, homebound or wheelchair bound or anything like that. Right. Uh, he was just sitting in a, in a chair, but he wasn't really eating much. He, my mom was making him potato salad and some, and he was eating potato salad and ice cream sandwiches. That's about what he was keeping down at the time. Um, but my uncle David was was a pretty tough guy. I mean, he'd been a trucker most of his life, you know. Um, but we got there for the weekend for uh, my cousin Davey's wedding, and he seemed to be in good spirits. He wasn't, you know, wasn't low on energy. We'd watch Raw together. He thought it was hysterical. He would, you know, he remembered the old days of, of uh, Haystacks Calhoun and wrestlers like that. So we were reminiscing about old wrestling. And so we were having a, we were having a good, good time, a good week. Uh, he even went fishing with my stepdad, which was unusual because they hadn't seen him get out of the house. Okay. Uh, so we left Colorado. Uh, Fort Lupton is where they lived. And I got home and I, I fell out right away, 12 hour drive from Fort Lupton to back to the cities, to Twin Cities metro area. I fell asleep and I had this dream and there were, there were clouds behind my, my uncle David. And he said, Hey kid, he said, uh, well, in case you haven't figured it out, I didn't make it. And I went, what do you mean you didn't make it? He said, nah, I, 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 I hung in there for Davy's wedding, but I didn't make it. I said, you died? He said, yeah, yeah, I crossed over, yeah. And, and I said, but, you know, what about Aunt Lorraine? What about Davey? What about, and he said, no, oh, they're going to be fine. They're going to be fine. Davey will look after your aunt. He's fine, you know. He said, things will be all right. And, I, and then I started to ask him questions. 
I started asking him questions about, I said, why the stereotypical clouds behind you? And he started laughing. He said, because that's just the way you would know I was, I was, you know, I had passed away. I said, oh, okay. He says, you know, I don't want to scare the hell out of you. And he started laughing. Right. I said, oh, okay. And I said, well, what's it like there? He said, oh, it's beautiful. You wouldn't believe it. You know? And I, I said, well, tell me about it. Tell me about it. He said, well, there's a lot you got to figure out for yourself. You know, I don't want to ruin the experience for you. Right. You know, but, but all that, all that shit you got in your head and all that stuff you're thinking about. Cause at that time you got to remember, I was having that little crisis of faith. I didn't, I thought there was nothing. Right. And he started talking to me about, you know, that, that shit you're thinking, that's not, that's not right. You know, there's something here. So he started talking to me about that. And, uh, so I woke up and I was like, I had this dream and I called my mom and I was like, call Lorraine right, right away. And she's like, well, why? And I said, I think uncle David died. And she was like, okay, I'll call her. I'll call you right back. She calls Lorraine, calls me back. She said, yeah, he passed away on our, on our drive, you know, our drive home. And I said, yeah, I, I thought so. And so she said, uh, they're going to have the funeral. She said, there's no reason for us to come out. It's just going to be a small one, you know, this, that, and the other. And, and at that point, I knew I had talked to him because it was just real. It just felt right. like he was standing right there. The background didn't feel real. It just felt like yeah. something he was projecting. Yeah. But it felt like he was standing right there. I had another lucid dream visitation uh, from uh, my grandpa Lasker when he passed away. Uh, he had, um, it was like a form of dementia, but he had, he had had, uh, he was over at the university of Minnesota. He had had, uh, two heart operations. The first one was, a I think it was a triple or a quadru quadruple bypass. The second one, he had a valve, uh, go out in his heart. They replaced it with a pig valve, but he waited too long to have that valve replaced. Right. So it was almost like an oxygen deprivation. And that had caused like a form of like dementia for lack of a better term. So, and he had all kinds of odd habits at the end. Like he would put newspapers over the windows before the sun went down, stuff like that. He turned the heat up to 90. He'd, you know, you'd come in, he'd be watching Baywatch. He'd say, Grandpa, what are you watching? <laughs> he'd say, I don't know what I'm watching, but I like what I'm watching. <laughs> you know? And you'd ask him, what? I, <laughs> sorry. It, it makes me laugh. The memory yeah. makes me laugh. Made me laugh. Um, he, he said, I wouldn't know what to do if I caught it anyways. Um, you know, it, it just stuff like that. Uh, but then, uh, he, <laughs> so I had this dream after he had passed away and, and I'm, I'm in a room and it's, you know, the, the old film noir detective movies where you just have the, the one single light hanging down. It's got the shade over it and it's kind yeah. of swinging. Yeah. Okay. Well, that light is swinging, but it's red. Okay. okay. And I can see just his knees, like he's sitting in a chair, but I can only see his knees. And he's asking me questions over and over and over again, because he used to do that in this dementia state. So we asked, you know, uh, who's going to pay for the burial? Do you know where the insurance policy is? Because he had an insurance policy okay. in his top drawer. Um, how is your mom going to get by? How is your sister going to get by? Who's going to look after the baby, which was my nephew at the time? Right. Um, and I was answering all these questions over and over and over and over and over again to him until finally he said, okay, now I can rest. Dream's over. I wake up. I'm like, holy shit. That, that it was exhausting. Yeah. Like I woke up and I was exhausted. But I knew based on the, the talks I had had with him when he had his first heart surgery and then his second valve surgery, he believed in purgatory. And everything he described to me, because he's a devout Catholic, right? everything he described to me felt like he was sitting in purgatory, huh. but he was coming to visit me so that he could get that, those answers answered so he could move on. Right. That's crazy. Yeah. And you've had a lot of guests to talk about the afterlife and talk about the, that kind of stuff mm -hmm. on the show. Uh, when you're listening to them talk about stuff, does it kind of reinforce some of these, those experiences you've had? Most definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. I, 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 in fact, I've, I've had a chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with 
and I won't call them out by name, but, but was some of the top experts in the field. And I've, I, that's a, that's a guilty pleasure that I don't brag about, but just that right. I got a privilege that a lot of people don't get. Um, right. and just had some of those, I guess, hypothesis or hypotheses, yeah. um, confirmed that, that, right. yeah, you, your gut feeling is probably right. If that's, if that's, that was his belief, then that's probably what you're, yeah, what you're, what you're thinking of. Yeah. Well, my next question, I guess, then is you want to name some of the big name guests that you've had on the show? A handful of them? It doesn't have to be those ones. It could be any of them. Oh, over the years. Yeah, sure. I'll yeah. name ones give, give, us, give us some things. Tell us what are the, some of the people have done. Oh, God. Any and everybody that you've ever seen. I was really talk- sad when you guys announced about Rosemary Ellen Guiley. I'm just going to say that right now. Yeah. <laughs> and but be- Rose, Rose should be one of the ones that we really do mention first. Um, Rosemary Ellen Guiley was one of the ones who was a huge contributor to our show. And uh, I was devastated when she died. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll tell you just a personal story. Um, we were at the Queen Mary uh, doing one of our events. And I got the privilege of uh, one, one day she was kind of walking around the ship. I said, what's going on, Rose? Do you need something? She said, uh, you know... I want to go get lunch, but I don't know how to go about it. She goes, I don't know how we get off the ship. And she was kind of like a little frustrated, you know? And I said, I haven't had lunch yet. If you'd like to go get lunch, I would be honored to take you into the long beach and go get you lunch. You know, I said, wherever you want to go. And I, I, you know, told her where the different restaurants were, what, what her choices were. She said, well, let's go get lunch. And I said, all right, let's go. And I had the most wonderful, I think we sat there for about an hour and a half, hour, 45 minutes. We sat and we talked and it wasn't necessarily about paranormal. It was just life. You know, it was, I had the most wonderful time with her just having lunch. Well, and we were talking earlier, I I introed the show. She was a paranormal expert. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. If If there was was one, she was the one. Uh, She she had a book on everything. Yeah. 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 She was the one, um, but just a, a beautiful human being. Right. And, and yeah, but she was, she was one of our, our, our best guests, one of our top guests. Uh, we've had John Zaffis on, we've uh, all, almost everybody from ghost hunters. Uh, you know, we've had, uh, uh not to be consi- confused with ghost adventures for those people that are, oh, but we've had but, ghosts on too. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, it, it, funny story. Um, we knew him, we knew him, just shortly after the movie came out on sci-fi. Okay. You guys, for you youngsters out there, they had a movie at one time. Um, they had a, a movie on sci-fi that eventually uh, they, they rolled into a series there on the old uh, travel channel. Um, but we started doing events with them after the movie came out on sci-fi and uh, did events with them up at the Goldfield Hotel. And we did some other events with them as well. We did an event over at the Stanley and, and had a wonderful time with those guys. They're uh, they're fun to hang out with. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, and and throughout the years, there's just been this. It's like a, it's like a, a killer's row of of amazing guests, and and there's so many. I mean, I I probably I could sit down and I could. You and I could sit here for half an hour and I could name off guests one right. after, another, after another, after another, you can name them. We've probably had them on the show. You're right. Right. Yeah. Of all the guests you've had on, is there one that really changed the show and how you were like, we should, we should add this or we should do this or we should, you know, or like the live events, like we should do these live events because that works or. You know, is there anything about the show that changed because of a guest or because of something that happened when a guest came to a show? The live events really started early in the conception of the show. The show started in 2006 and it okay. was the, uh, it was probably about summer, spring or summerish of 2006. That Dave and I were sitting around and, and we were trying to think of, <laughs> this may not come off as real great, but this is the way it came off we were trying to think of other business models to go along with the podcast at okay. the time, because as a small, put it this way, 
this is going to be backwards thinking compared to today. Today, podcasting right. is a model in itself. Right. Okay. You got to remember, we were on a radio show and we were surprised that people were listening across the U.S. on podcasts. Okay. At the time, there were five or six paranormal shows. Right. God, I sound like such an old man in a mountain on a rocking <laughs> chair right now. You know, kids, back in my day. Back in my day. Now there are something like 20 to 25,000 paranormal podcasts. Think about that for a minute. Right. Okay. Um, but when we started, podcasts were a throwaway benefit that you just cast out to the wind after you did your radio show. It was literally a freebie. Right. Okay. It was like, here, you can listen to the archive of this show after it's done airing, and we'll just throw it up on a website. If you choose to think that you want to go to this website to listen to it, you can. Congratulations. You get right. your freebie. Um, in fact, uh, we have a friend who used to work for MTV Networks, and he got booed out of a national public radio seminar of programmers because he dared to suggest if you charged a quarter for the Car Talk podcast, a quarter, you could make a million dollars a year for national public radio. This was back in the late 2000s, okay? Wow. He got booed off the stage by programmers because he dared to suggest charging for podcasts. Crazy. Isn't that a crazy notion? Right. Right. We would have thought about that today. Now it's like, give, give now me that money. <laughs> right. Now, if you told somebody I'm only charging a quarter for my podcast, you, you, it's a bargain. Right. But I, I digress. So, right. uh, so at that time we only had five, five or so paranormal shows. I, I know there was night watch out there. There was Sp spooky South coast. Um, I'm trying to think of who else was out there. There was us. Uh, we had Coast to Coast who was doing podcasts. Um, I'm trying to think of who else was out there. I mean, there, there, there really wasn't much out there. Right. Um, but we, uh, so we put this out there and we're, we start getting responses. We start getting responses from the West Coast, from the East Coast. We start getting responses from Australia. And we're like, Australia? There's people in Australia listening to a little show in Minnesota. Right. You know, and then we start realizing that the numbers are bigger for us worldwide than they are in the Twin Cities. Yeah. What the hell's going on here? Right. So then we realize we've got a bigger audience worldwide than we have in our own hometown. Wow. And then we go, you know what? We need a, a business model, not just because we we're thinking we're going to sell advertising locally. Well, advertising locally does nothing for our worldwide audience. Right. What are we going to do for our worldwide audience? So I'm sitting on the phone. I'm talking to Dave one night. And you remember, you probably don't remember a show about rock and roll fantasy camp that was on Bravo. I don't. Okay. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching this rock and roll fantasy camp. And I think it was, I think it might've been Sammy Hagar and some guys from Sticks and some guys from some other bands. And they're sitting around and they're, they're teaching these students for rock and roll fantasy camp. And I look at it and I go, Hey, you have a pretty good relationship with those ghost hunters guys, don't you? And he goes, yeah, because he had met them at UNIFCON over right. at Penn State in 2005. And I said, I got an idea. And he goes, what's that? And I go, we should combine rock and roll fantasy camp with an old radio idea of doing tours. And he goes, that's a pretty good idea. And he came up with the idea of the seminars during the day. You teach seminars during the day. And you go and ghost hunt these different areas at night. Right. And voila, darkness events was born. That's awesome. And, and, that's, I, and I've never been to one, but I always tell my wife, it's like, we should go. And she's like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> and she, and she doesn't really necessarily believe as much. And I'm like, I totally believe. In fact, I got a whole family history and all kinds of experiences, which we can get to on another day. Um, and it's just like, no. And I'm like, but they're right here. They're just, they're just going to be doing one right up in St. In St. Cloud. It's going to be, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so. it's, it's a good time. It's a really good time. So I, you know, and, and since that time, I mean, the formula, the wheel has been done over and over right. again by many different 
promoters and companies. What's, and, what is one of the creepiest experiences you've had on one of those events? I mean, I know you've said on your show that you're kind of like the anti-magnet to the paranormal and they kind of run away from you, but... Uh... They do. Um, <laughs> I got to say probably uh, there are two, I, and I mentioned them before, but the one would be watching uh, Waverly Hills, um, watching uh, Father... Uh, Father Andy Calder with the um, vial of holy water, setting the holy water down and watching the holy water just dissipate out of the out of the container. Wow! You know, as he's trying to say prayers, and we knew that there was some presence there, like we had smelled a like a scat sulfur smell there. And he's trying to say a prayer, and you just see the the holy water dissipating out of the out of the vial. That was something else. Um, I'd say the second would probably be that same spot. Um, but on the, I think it was the fourth floor. We were up on the fourth floor. Okay. Same scat smell. And my ovulus going off saying demon, 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 demon. And, uh, you know, and then Chip Coffee saying, well, does anybody want to do a prayer? <laughs> <You know? laughs> There's a group of 20 of us up on the roof and it was like, yeah, I think that was probably a good time. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, th those, those two, probably the most creepy out of, out of both of them. Is there anything you particularly do going into those events to like set yourself up to, to protect yourself? Cause there's always stories about stuff following people home and then things happening and then having to clear the home and, and things like that. Is there anything you personally do before you go in? I know everybody's a little bit different, oh, sure. but. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I have a Benedictine medal and I say my prayers and I have, uh, you know, I put the white light of protection around me and I, yeah, absolutely. I'm very diligent about all that. In fact, I, I say a prayer to St. Michael every night before I go to bed. Okay. Uh, because I, I have, you're going to think this is weird, Nick. I have not had a peaceful dream in, it's been over a decade. Every night when I go to sleep, I have some sort of dream where I'm getting the literal shit kicked out of me by something that looks like a huge monster or a demon, or it takes different forms, but I'm literally fighting for my life every night. So I went, when I started saying, these prayers to St. Michael, they stopped. Do you think yeah. that it's, I know we have a lot of Wiccan people that listen to our show mm -hmm. uh, and, and other religious uh, ilks. Do you think that it is specific? And I don't want to get into theology and the debate of theology, but sure. do you, sure. do you feel that what a person's personal belief is actually can, you know, if somebody else believes in something and that's what they pray to, that that will affect things the same way as, a Christian doing the St. Michael's prayer or, you know, a Jewish person doing their rites. Um, I, I think it's, I think it, it might, if, if you want to look at it from simply from a scientific point of view, it's good intention. Okay. It's just setting myself up with good intention before I go to sleep. It's like having a, it's like having a blankie, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, I, I truly do believe that. Uh, it's not, it's not anything other than that. Um, I think there's been enough horrible things that have happened to me in my life that it, if anything, it can't hurt. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, I think it, it wards off to me in my mind, it wards off anything, anything that could potentially happen to me as I go into that REM sleep. Right. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, that's what it is. Yeah. That's I mean, exactly. I have, I have holy water with Michael on the back of it. I have, I have a cross, but I also have, I have black tourmaline crystals mm -hmm. that I keep on me. I have a little bowl of salt that I have over my bedstand so I can sleep because I swear to God, there's been a portal opened in our house a couple of years ago. And I'm like, I got to close that damn thing. <laughs> and mm -hmm. since I put that salt out there, I've been able to sleep and I haven't had super bad issues. So there I'm right go. there with you. I am right there with you. Yeah. Um, what about other paranormal things? Are there any other things that super interest you? Like, obviously, your show runs the gamut of everything. You know, do, or do obviously big walking for Bigfoots means you have to go out into the outdoors, the the great outdoors. But you know, you know UFOs, cryptids, things like that. Is there any of that kind of stuff that you're really like, man, that would be really cool 
to go and see or go looking for or things like that that really stand up besides obviously ghosts and dream visitations? Before the Sharko foot thing, I, I I used to like going out in the outdoors. I I I was uh, when I was younger. I mean, our entire family has been avid hunters and fishermen. I I didn't mind going out in, into the outdoors. I never really saw anything when I was out there. Um, right. But uh, I didn't mind going outdoors. I, it was getting up. I, I'm a big guy, so climbing trees is just a it's just a bitch. I don't like it at all. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, on the show, I, I like tackling conspiracy theories, but here's the deal. And I've learned this from public speaking. I do a, I do a talk on conspiracy theory. Uh, but you have to be careful how far down the rabbit hole you go when you only have an hour. Right. So I do a talk where we balance it a little bit. We try not to go down issues where people really want to get hardcore about it. Uh, there is a way to tackle certain hardcore issues and not get too far into it where you can get to a point where you get argumentative about it. Um, which I know that's like saying, Oh, look, I can, I can only put in just the tip. Um, but it's uh I, I know it's a horrible analogy, but it's true. Um, but I do love tackling conspiracy theory on the, on the show. And I don't know, I don't know how tolerant the audience is of that. Right. To be honest with you, because it, there's two things that, that mess with an audience's mind at that point, there's political belief, which our audience wants to stay away from. Right. And there is a, their sensibilities, which the, again, it's, it's show me the happy ending at the end of the book. Right. Right. Don't show me the bad ending that could potentially happen. And conspiracy theory never deals with a happy ending. There's never That's a happy true. ending in a conspiracy theory. Um, so although I like conspiracy theories, I, I like them for, and I don't like them for the fact that they're bad endings. I don't like them for the fact that they're just BS crazy. I like them for the, the what if, you know, I like them for the sheer, maybe that could have happened. Right. You know, I like them for the alternate looking into it and saying, yeah, it could, maybe it could have happened that way. Right. Um, just a different scenario, a different outlook, a different take on it. Um, but there are a lot of people that can't see it in a healthy way. And that's what disturbs me about when we, as we get to a society that becomes more polarized, it's hard to tackle conspiracy theory. Right. When we started in 2006, you could do a conspiracy theory show. You remember the old Art Bell shows? Conspiracy theory was huge with Art. He they loved were. conspiracy theory and it worked and it was great. That's what hooked me about Art Bell. I love the conspiracy theory shows. Um, but you can't do them these days. Yeah. You just can't. When you guys had you guys had a conspiracy theorist on, I don't know, four years ago, and I don't know why this particular episode stood out in my mind, but it was a guy that was being followed basically by the government. He thinks he had a tracker in him, and like they had yeah. invisible suits attacking him in his in his living room, and he was constantly moving and trying to be going to doctors to get scans, and they were following him and calling him, and you know he'd be out in the middle of nowhere and they'd find him you know there'd be a drone that show, showed up and before drones were super popular and for yep. some reason that episode and that interview that you guys did terrified the hell out of me and to this day it's one of the ones that stands out in my mind i did one recently on true crime tuesday about havana syndrome and i had on a british intelligence agent frank milburn and I got good reception about it. Uh, Frank and Frank is on the inside, inside. In fact, George Knapp had him on uh, coast to coast as well. And uh, he, he's got documents. He's got, he's got things that, and this is how much it spooked me, Nick. And I have not talked on the show about this at all. Okay. Uh, we, we did the show on Havana syndrome. And I'm sitting, I'm talking to one of my buddies and I think it was three days after we did the show on Havana syndrome, the CIA comes out and says, Havana syndrome did not originate in Russia. 
after Frank comes out and says, I have documents that show Havana syndrome originates in Russia, that they use RF energy, that they, this is the way they do it. They use your router, they use your cell phone, they, uh, to, to attack regular people. They're going after our, um, they're going after our scientists inside our aerospace, uh, technology companies. Uh, they're targeting these people, these people, these people, um, and Three, two to three days later, the CIA issues that report. Wow! And the FBI issues, and the you know, and the FBI says, "Well, we're, we'll we'll investigate," but we, you know, the CIA says, "Nope, that's not how it's happening." And I'm like, "What the shit? What? Well, how did that come out so fast?" So did you turn all your electronics off in your house immediately after that? And be like, I don't want to die. I don't. I don't want Havana syndrome. I, I started lining my closets with tin foil. It's like, <laughs> no way. I mean, that, that was spooky that if you talk about stuff that spooks you out, right. that was spooky. Well, tell us a little bit about more, more about true crime Tuesday. Uh, obviously like on the social media and everything, I was talking all about the paranormal. I was talking about paranormal night shift. And then today mm -hmm. you were like true crime Tuesday. And I was like, I facepalm. I went, how did, could I not have mentioned true crime Tuesday? Well, it, it, it appears the free version appears on the same IP as, mm -hmm. as darkness radio. So if you're subscribed to darkness radio, you get the free version, obviously, but we'd like you to subscribe to the premium version. Uh, the premium version has tr uh, dumb crime, stupid criminals attached to it in case you forgot that segment. Um, and it's, it's uh, $5 a month to, to get, uh, you know, the dumb crime, stupid criminals in the premium version, but you also get true crime Tuesday and you get darkness radio ad free. And you of course you get hundreds of podcasts uh, from stitcher ad free as well. Uh, but true crime Tuesday is, is there and still in the lineup and there on Tuesdays. And uh, yeah, it, it, we've had some really, really exciting guests lately. And in fact, we have a guy on tomorrow by the name of Ron Francel and Ron Francel has a book out there called shadow man. And shadow man is basically a story about the first case ever to be exposed to FBI profiling. So the, the very beginnings of actual criminal profiling in the FBI and how that unit came to be oh, wow. and about the first case they profiled in Montana. So, yeah, it's, it's an exciting book. And I, I whipped through this book, Nick, in two days. I just right through nice. it. it, it it's, a, it's, a, it's a fast read. Uh, there's a lot of, I don't want to say it's complicated because it's not complicated, but there's a lot of different cases that that intertwine with each other okay and the ending will will make your jaw drop wow. and it'll, it's it's one of those oh no type of endings where you just go Duh! but one of the things that ron does in the novel that i give him complete credit to that a lot of novelists don't i should say book not novel but book that a lot of authors don't do is he updates you on every single player in the in the uh, in the book, he oh, okay. lets you know what happened to him. And a lot of times, uh, an author will stop the story, and that's the end of the story, and you never find out what happened to the people in the book. Uh, he lets you know with oh, every single cool. every single person in the book what happened with them. So uh, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I had a really good conversation with him. I taped that show today, and. And I, I was, I was really impressed. So that, that interview gets released to the, uh, tomorrow at three. Tomorrow. Awesome. Yep. So everybody can get that tomorrow, which is those who are listening to the podcast. That'll mean today because ours drops tomorrow as well. Oh, there you go. There you go. There we so, go. Awesome. Yeah. So as soon as you're done listening to this, go over there and listen to that. Um, there you go. so I want to jump shift back to the paranormal. Sure. As we wind down here, you were on discovery Plus's paranormal night shift. Yes, I was. I was. That's where the that's where the joke the the intro came from, where I made the the comment about you are a paranormal expert because that's what they list you as. They as do. You are a paranormal expert. So it's official. Exactly. It's on TV, which means it's <laughs> on the internet, and everything on the internet is true. Um, <laughs> uh, how was that experience for you? How did they How did they come to you? And like, what is kind of the process of doing that show? Uh, well, I got to credit Dave with this one. It was okay. Dave's idea. Um, I, I had joked for years that um, I was the only guy in the paranormal never to have a TV show. I wore it like a badge of honor. Um, 
I carried it around with me. I put it on a signpost and I would march outside of every convention. I've never been on a TV show. Um, but uh, yeah, then he went and ruined it. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he was, I believe he was filming, I think it was going to film the first season of Holzer Files. And okay. he had, he had done Haunted Hospitals. The, uh, the same series is produced by the same producer. So Haunted Hospitals also does Paranormal Night Shift. Now, if you remember the episode that he did of Haunted Hospitals, I appeared as a large black man in his recreation, uh, which I'm very proud of because that man was- I was, was going to ask you about that that story because I didn't know the backstory. Like you guys have made a, jokes about it. I was like, I don't know this story. Yeah, Dave's Dave's hospital story in which he he uh, suffered a, an ailment and then was, was doped up uh, and saw spirits. He um, <laughs> evidently when- uh, when he went to look at me, I appeared as a, appeared as a large, glorious, uh, gorgeous black man. And, and I look nothing like that. I, but, you know. I, I mean, you're gorgeous, but. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you're that. But nothing like that guy. I mean, he was, he was a good looking man. I, I, I couldn't reproduce those, those, uh, those looks if I tried. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so they approached him about doing. Uh, paranormal night shift. He goes, well, I'm off to do my own series, but hey, you might want to take a look at this guy over here, who, by the way, looks nothing like what you casted over on Haunted Hospitals. <laughs> um, but hey, you can have this this twerp over here, and so uh, and so I sent in a reel, and uh, they said, yeah, you look enough like Schrader, we'll take you. Um, so I <laughs> I went uh, I went up to uh, our neighbors to the north there, Canada. And uh, took a trip up there, and uh, they sent me. They actually, what's really nice is they sent me um, the stories ahead of time, so I got okay. to review the stories ahead of time. And I was going to ask idea. you about that. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And so I, I got to review the stories ahead of time. You get to know the stories a little bit. And uh, went up there to film, and uh, the crew was very nice. Actually, I, I got uh, a little bit of inside baseball here, Nick, between you and me. Okay. You ready for this? I thought I had a little something to. Um, my, my littlest nephew, uh, Gavin, was a huge Blues Clues fan. It's in the same studio as Blues Clues, oh. right? So yeah, yeah, right. So I thought, hey, I, you know, Uncle Timmy's got some 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 street cred here, right? So I'm in the building and I'm looking at the wireless router and it says Blues Clues. So I I do a screen capture and I send it to my mom, who's watching him at the time, and I said tell him I'm in the same studio as Blue's Clues, which got no reaction whatsoever. <laughs> and so then I'm sitting there. Now, here's the creepy part. If you want the, the creepiest thing that ever happened on Paranormal Night Shift, I'm about to tell you. You ready okay. for this? You're okay. getting an exclusive here, Nick. You okay. ready? Here it is. I'm sitting in the chair. We're doing our, we're doing our shots, right? And I'm doing my shots for the show. And so we're between... We're, we're between takes we're between set and we're doing setups and i so i say to him so the the blues clue set is down the hall right and they said yeah down down the hall to the left i said is this a set open right now can i go down and look at it he said no it's not open right now and no we definitely can't go down and look at it i said really i said what's a big deal i said it's a set I'm like yeah no we can't we can't go down and look at it they wouldn't like that i'm like why are we whispering we don't mention blues clues when they're not here. I'm like, okay. I said, so whatever happened to Steve anyways? They went, we don't talk about that either. That was it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> big, Canadian, big Canadian secret. I don't know if they chopped him up into lunch meat. And then all of a sudden he shows up, you know, in that, that, that little internet commercial thing where he's like, I'm Steve and I'm okay. And then I don't know if he was blinking twice to summon that, you know, <laughs> summon the Canadian Mo Royal Mounted Police to help him or whatever it was he was doing in that video. But um, yeah, but they don't mention Steve. Wow. Yeah. That, that's kind of creepy. That is kind of creepy. Isn't that creepy? I didn't feel right after that. I was like, okay, we don't mention Steve. I mean, I, I was, and then I was like, not even in passing. And he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he had this blank look like, no, we don't. Wow. Yeah. Well, 
people who are listening can catch you. You start on what episode <laughs> eight ish? I'm changing. I'm like that's, that's too creepy for me. Let's just, great, let's move on. That's, that's creepy great. as hell. That's a great. That was a, that's like an M Night Shyamalan right. transition there. Yeah. All right. So your show oh, is on. We're out of here. Sorry, I'm, right. uh, I'm done with that one. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, so so the show you're on what episode? You start up on that episode eight ish, nine ish, somewhere around there, is when you show uh, up. Uh no 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 uh, episode three episode is, three. Uh, Yep, I start. I couldn't remember. It's been a while since I watched the show because I yeah. watched it a while back. So I couldn't and remember. Exactly. By the way, the the Tim that's on radio in episode one is not me. Folks. I it's always not, thought that that was yeah. what you guys were referencing. Every no, time no, you no. guys made, I was like, "Is he talking about that one?" I don't. Maybe not. Although, that makes sense. But although I have had, what at least one supernatural experience in a radio station, it's yeah. not been a bad one. But but no, in fact, the one supernatural experience I had. Uh, in a radio station was at KLBB. Uh, Dave and I were in studio. We were in a little production studio sitting side by side. We're talking to a psychic at the time, Bob Baca from Iowa. And he's telling me that there's a spirit standing off to our right. Who's looking into at the time we had a blue frame, you know, when you're in a production studio, you have a window in front of you. Yeah. Well, we had a blue frame around our window. Bob's never been to our studio before. And he's saying, you have a blue frame around the window that's in front of you. And you have a spirit standing off to, I believe it's Tim's right, Tim's right shoulder. And as somebody who used to work with Tim, and he died from, uh, he said, some sort of asphyxiation. And he's describing my former colleague that I used to work with who actually died from asphyxiation on his couch. Wow. Yeah, he had had his stomach stapled, and uh, well, or he had had a gastric bypass, and uh, he used to. There were times where he would eat food that wasn't good for him. Yeah, yeah. And he did that one night. He was over fundraising for uh, Twin Cities Public Television, and he had decided he was going to eat fish sticks and tartar sauce, and then uh, slug it down with a soda, and then he laid down on the couch with his kitties, and it was the night of a yeah. uh, comet, uh, and. And he went to watch the comet and the stars. He laid down on the couch and he aspirated on his own vomit and died. And Bob oh. called all of that from Iowa. Wow. And he said that, uh, he said, my friend had a message for me. He gave me the message and he also gave me a message to pass on to his wife. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Amazing guests, amazing people, amazing conversations. Uh, it's been awesome having you on here. Where are you going to be? You're going to be up at the Michigan Paracon in August. I am August 25th through the 27th, miparacon.com to get your tickets are going fast and rooms are going even faster. You can't get a room without a ticket. Just a reminder. So go to miparacon.com, uh, get your tickets for the weekend. They're, they're actually really, really reasonable. And the, anybody who's anybody that you've ever wanted to meet in the paranormal is going to be there at Michigan Paragon paracon.com and i also want to remind people there's another convention out there that's kind of named itself similar to michigan paracon don't be fooled folks the original michigan paracon is at miparacon.com awesome thank you very much and your twitter is at dr tim dennis well at dr tim dennis i, I, I like to say doctor I'm dr not a tim doctor, dennis not an expert <laughs> uh instagram darkness radio tim if you want to contact him with your paranormal stories tim at darknessradio.com they often will read them on the please supernatural do yes. news and parashare yep episodes. please please send your parashare stories to uh tim at darknessradio.com uh or if you want to call in and leave a voicemail 651-300-4977 651-300-4977. Uh, if it's longer than three minutes, just call back. Leave the rest of your story. I'll stitch them together. And Beer City Bruiser from Ring of Honor and myself will uh, will give you a wrestling critique of your story. So, awesome. I'm kidding. It's not a wrestling critique. It's not. Well, it's, not. it's underwater needlepoint. That's right. Underwater, underwater needlepoint. <laughs> no, we'll actually weigh in on your paranormal uh your paranormal story if you want us to or we'll answer a question you have or we'll we'll just go hmm really cool and, and those shows have a lot of fun levity to them as well um mm -hmm. and you know if they say paranormal or not paranormal if they say uh phenomenon just be prepared uh <laughs> i can play that for you oh wait i don't have it up on the <laughs> it's all right. all right that's all right i don't know if it would, i don't know if it would come through or not on, on the zoom call um it, 
Does this? Oh, I sure did. That did come through. Yeah, see? <laughs> nice. I'm just going to have you on the background for all future episodes. Sorry, you've been hijacked. <laughs> <laughs> just to play the just to play the audio, uh, uh, you can also find information at darknessradio.com. So make sure you check out Tim Dennis, check out Darkness Radio, guys. Our next episode is going to be April fourth with New York Times bestselling author Kirsten White will be joining us. We're talking about the paranormal now. She wrote the Paranormal C series, The Conqueror Saga, Slayer, Star Wars, Padawan. The list goes on and on. We're going to talk about her new upcoming book, Hide. April 18th, audiobook Hall of Famer, Luke Daniels. He's going to be joining us. His voice is narrated over 600 books, including many of the authors we've had on this very show, such as Kevin Hearn, Scott Mayer, Justin Leslie, and more in the future, I am sure. So make sure you join us April 18th. May 2nd, Rhiannon Held will be joining us. She's also known as R.Z. Held. She's the author of the Silver Series, Amsterdam Series, and has been featured in multiple anthologies. So make sure you stay tuned and join us for all of those. Make sure to follow us and rate and review. It helps us get seen and in turn helps our amazing guests get seen as well. So for Tim Dennis, I am Nick, and thank you for listening to Epic Realms.